Good morning, Brickswood Church. Great to be back with you again this week. We're having a, uh, quite a, a, a challenge to uh, put this program together every week, but we, we, I think we found our stride. I'm very impressed with all the people that have contributed to our Sunday events. Uh, and even this past week when we had our church opening, had a great crowd, about 30 people showed up. Great weather, had a nice time of fellowship together, and Lord's Supper as well as a prayer time. Uh, this week, we are going to again have uh, another church opening, 11.30 through 1.30. Bring a lunch and a beverage for yourself. If it's a nice day, bring a lawn chair. We'll meet outside. And then around 1 o'clock, we'll gather in our community room for a time of uh, brief devotional and prayer together before we leave. Uh, just a note that uh, on Father's Day, we will not be meeting here at the church. We'll give you a break so you can honor your fathers on that day. And then we'll come back on the 28th of the month and uh, continue to meet together. Hopefully we'll have great weather. Uh, we may might even bring a, a barbecue out for you to bring something to cook on a grill. Another note on the 28th of this month, a couple of weeks, we'll be having our quarterly business meeting. Of course, it'll be online, so you will be given notice uh, how to click the button on your screens uh, computers access our um, Zoom call, and we'll actually have some uh, things for you to vote on. So uh, members particularly will need quorum to help with our voting, but otherwise we have some really great reports to give you uh, what God's been doing in our midst in this meantime. Let me just read a brief scripture for you as uh, we continue in our time of worship. Out of Zephaniah chapter 3, Verse 17, it says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, He will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. And He will rejoice over you with singing. We don't often think of God as the one who sings over us. Uh, today, may we join Him in singing as we worship Him in spirit and in truth. And as we join our voices all together as his body of believers to honor him and praise him and to worship him. Would you bow with me in prayer as we continue? Father God, it's your day. You created this day for worship, for us to set aside our time, uh, any other interests that we have, uh, the things that are heavy in our heart, we can release them into your hands because we know you care for us. It's a day that we've come to rejoice in you. Thank you for your goodness to uh, honor the, uh, the things that you've done in our life and around us, how you've answered our prayers, and how you've protected us during the season of virus as well. So as we continue our worship, Father, may it be pleasing to you and acceptable to you. Uh, may this be a time of celebration of your goodness, a time of listening to you as your spirit intercedes into our hearts through the word that Sean will be preaching today. And may we leave changed because we've been in your presence. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt in praise the Our salvation 
Jesus, for our sake, you died. And praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory.
I'm filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. I'm filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. King of kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Before we continue with more songs in worship, would you join me in prayer as I read this prayer out of Ephesians 3? For this reason, we kneel before you, Father, from whom all families in heaven and on earth derives his name. We pray that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. And we pray that us being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I've seen many searching for it. Searching for answers, only you provide because you know just what we need before we say our word. Good, 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 God. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You 
My name is Sean. I'm one of the pastors at Brookswood Church. Uh, if you're joining us online for the first time, I'm glad you're with us today. Question for you guys. How many of you have a subscription to Netflix or maybe Disney Plus? Uh, the recent polls tell us that people have been watching a lot of Netflix over the last two and a half months, which I guess is what you do when there's a global pandemic and the stores are closed and you can't see your friends. So second question for you, how many of you have seen the uh, movie Avengers Endgame? Yeah, probably a lot of you. This is the one, you know, with Iron Man and Thor and now Spider-Man and then Paul Bettany's playing this weird red dude with like a diamond in his forehead. I think his name is Vision. Anyways, here's what's fascinating about this movie. Uh, there are 21 movies in the Avengers series and they are all telling one story. Over 10 years, 21 movies telling the exact same story, and it all culminates with Endgame. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but there are actually 66 books that make up the Bible. 40 authors wrote 66 books on three different continents over the course of 2,000 years, and they're all telling the same story. It's all one story. Did you know that? And I'm sorry to break it to you, but the, uh, the story ain't about you. <laughs> the Bible is actually not some kind of self-help book. It's, uh, it's not a, a roadmap to life. It's uh, not a book of advice. Actually, very importantly, the Bible is God's self-disclosure of himself. The Bible is actually all about Jesus. It's the story of God redeeming and saving from the ends of the earth those who are far from him because of their sin. And then he redeems them and ransoms them back from death. And so the whole Bible is one story and it's all about Jesus Christ. Jesus said so when he was talking to the Pharisees in John 5, 39 when he said, The scriptures bear witness about me. Or on the road to Emmaus, Jesus took two confused disciples through the Old Testament scriptures, showing them the quote, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. And so Jesus Christ is actually the central figure of the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, Jesus is hidden and anticipated. 
And in the New Testament, he is revealed and enjoyed. And the whole point of the Bible is that we should come to know and enjoy and love and serve and believe and find life in this Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and Savior of the world. And so the Word of God, the Bible, is God speaking to us through his Son and God speaking to us about his Son. Now, what's interesting is that the Christian church has been uh, in agreement on this for nearly 2,000 years. In agreement that God exists, that God has made himself known, and that the Bible tells us uh, about God's self-revelation through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I say nearly 2,000 years because about 100 years ago, some people began uh, introducing a new and very different view of the Bible. They began questioning the Bible as God's word to us, as a revelation from God. And they began claiming that the Bible was simply human words about God. That the Bible was simply the evolving story of human thinking about what God might be like. In which case, the Bible would not be God's word to us, but the record of our words about God. Now, maybe you see the Bible this way. This is actually a very common view these days, even though it's a very new view in the history of the world. But what I want to point out is that these are two very different views of the Bible. In one, the Bible is God's word, God's word to us. And in the other, the Bible is our word about God. And what you believe about the Bible will shape how you use it and how you respond to it. And so if you believe that the Bible is merely a human word about God, you may want to read it for inspiration. You know, put a little uh, verse up on your wall that inspires you. But when it does not fit your view of life, or fit your worldview anymore, you'll feel free to simply disagree and disregard it and choose your own path. And if the Bible is merely a collection of human words about God, it will be natural for you to say, well, that was then, and this is now. And if you believe the Bible is a human word about God, then lastly, you won't be moved to place your trust in Jesus Christ as the Son of God for the forgiveness of your sins. And so I want to make it very clear today that uh, this church, Brookswood Church, we do not view the Bible as uh, a collection of human words or thoughts about God. It's not our word about God. It is God's word to us. And so our Brookswood statement of faith actually reads like this. We believe that the Bible is the revealed word of God fully and verbally inspired, written under the direction of the Holy Spirit. We believe it is without error in the original manuscripts, and it is true and trustworthy in all that it asserts, and it has supreme authority in all matters of faith and conduct. So this is actually the second message in our new series, Questions from the Congregations. And today, we're going to answer a question that came in, which was, why is the Bible called the Word of God? Which means that today, uh, I get a chance to take you through a little bit of the doctrine of inspiration. And the place that we're going to start then, the best place to start, as always, is going to be with Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to kind of put it on your thinking caps today. There may be a little bit more uh, thinking involved today's uh, lesson than maybe normal, but it's going to be worth your time. So let's start with what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Now, if you're a Christian, by definition, uh, you ought to believe what Jesus teaches, right? He is the Son of God. He is our Savior and Lord, and we must follow his example, obey his commands, and it would be wise to say the very least, to believe about the Scriptures what Jesus believes about the Scriptures. And if you're not a Christian, I imagine that you still uh, value what Jesus said. See, most people think, uh, at the very least, that Jesus was a good teacher. And so, even if you're investigating Christianity, 
this will actually be a very good place for you to start with what does Jesus say the Bible is? What did Jesus believe about the Bible? Now, it might be funny to think of Jesus having a Bible because, well, he didn't. (laughs) He didn't have a King James or a New International Version on his bedside table. But they had scrolls. Jesus, like every first century Jew, was actually very familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures or what we would call the Old Testament, which was the Bible of his day. And right off the bat, I'm going to tell you, Jesus' view of the Hebrew Bible was that it was the infallible, uh, authoritative word of God. It was God's very words to us. And if you understood it correctly, it could never be wrong, and it would never lead you astray. Let me show you what Jesus believed. So when the Sadducees one time tried to uh, entangle Jesus, trick Jesus uh, into a, an argument about a uh, debate about the resurrection from the dead, which the Sadducees didn't believe in, Jesus responded by saying, you are wrong because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. You are mistaken because you do not know the scriptures. Now, in another argument with the Sadducees in John 10, 34 to 35, uh, Jesus quotes Psalm 82, a part of Psalm 82 in his defense. And he says, uh, I'm right (laughs) because the Scripture cannot be broken. Now, the details of this debate don't matter to us uh, right now. They're a little complicated. But what does matter is that here, Jesus is defending himself, and he appeals actually to one word from Psalm 82. And yet, he doesn't actually have to prove or argue that Psalm 82 is authoritative. In fact, it's a, uh, a passing comment that he throws out that Scripture cannot be broken. And he says it as if his uh, opponents already agree with him on this fact, which they did, which is why Jesus says, therefore you know that I'm right, because the Scriptures say this, and the Scriptures cannot be broken. And so for Jesus, anything from Scripture, down to the individual words and the least known passages, possessed unquestioned authority. Jesus also referred to Scripture as, quote, the commandment of God, Matthew 15, 3, and as the word of God, Mark 7, 13. And he indicated also that Scripture was indestructible. He said famously, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not one dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matthew 5, 17 to 18. And he said at the end of his ministry, These are my words that I speak to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Luke 24, 44. And the reason these words must be fulfilled is because they are God's words. And God's word never fails. One last small but powerful example is the way that Jesus responded to the Pharisees when they tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any reason? Now he answered by referring back to Genesis 2.24, where Moses wrote, catch this, Moses wrote, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is not a quotation from God. In fact, it doesn't say who the author is. We just know uh, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible from tradition. But Jesus answers the Pharisees' question like this. He says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said... Now, who's doing the saying there? Pay attention. The one who made the male and female is doing the saying. God said. 
So listen to the implication of Jesus saying that God said this. Let me read the whole passage. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, and then he quotes Moses from Genesis 2.24, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In other words, Jesus can take any scripture from the Old Testament, like Genesis 2.24, written by Moses, and say, God said. And that's why scripture, according to Jesus, cannot be broken. It is God's very words to us, all of it. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And there are many other places that we could look to uh, see Jesus' view of the Old Testament. But moving on, Jesus not only honors the Old Testament as inspired, but he also actually claims the same authority for himself and his own words in his own teaching ministry. So in John 14.10, Jesus says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Or John 8.28, Jesus says, I speak as the Father has taught me. Or John 12.49, The Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And then repeatedly, when he was correcting the authoritative religious tradition of his day, he would say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And so Jesus places his own words Uh, in the same category as Scripture, as authoritative, the very words of God himself. But not only does Jesus acknowledge the inspiration and the authority of the Old Testament Scriptures uh, and then affirm his own authority, he also looks forward to the day uh, when the apostles would write the Gospels and the Epistles uh, to form the foundation of the church. And Jesus actually promises them that he would provide for them the divine inspiration necessary to give the church this foundation. For example, in John 14, 26, Jesus says to his 12 disciples, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And in John 16, 13, he said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And so Jesus says, Don't worry that the apostles uh, won't remember my teachings, my miracles, my life. Don't worry that... uh, They will not be able to correctly understand the implications of my life for the church because I will give them the Holy Spirit and he will divinely inspire them, bring to their remembrance all that I have taught and done. And he will guide them into all truth that they may uh, declare the things that are to come. And so that's exactly what we see happening then when the apostles write down Uh, From memory, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the gospel gospel records of Jesus' life. And they begin to uh, work out the implications of Jesus' teaching for the life of the church in the epistles. And so then, when we come to these uh, gospels and epistles and the apostles' writings, uh, we want to ask the question, well, what, what was their view of Scripture? Did they know this was happening? Did they think that they were writing the inspired Scripture? We're going to start with Peter, all right? 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, Peter says this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke 
from God as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. This, this word is actually the word used for a ship being moved or carried along by the wind in the water. And so Peter here very clearly describes uh, at least the Old Testament scriptures as men speaking God's words by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what about Paul? Well, Paul probably has the most famous uh, verse in the Bible talking about the inspiration of Scripture comes from his letter, uh, second letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. And like Peter, referring to the Old Testament, Paul writes, All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. All Scripture, Paul says, is God-breathed. This is actually the place where we get the uh, word inspiration, the idea of inspiration from. The Apostle Paul here, what he does is he takes two Greek words, uh, theo, the word for God, and noustos, the word for breath or spirit, and he puts them together into a new word, God-breathed, the only time it shows up in the New Testament. Scripture is God-breathed or actually inspirited containing the Spirit of God. And what this is saying is that God breathed out Scripture. God spoke it. Scripture is the very word, the very breath of God. Now, they agree with Jesus on this. Now, what's amazing, though, is what happens next. Peter, in 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16, he actually puts Paul's writings, Paul's epistles, in the same category as the rest of Scripture. Peter writes, Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all the letters when he speaks of them and of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Peter considers Paul's writings here as part of the other scriptures. And so Paul too, Peter is saying, is carried along by the Holy Spirit as he writes scripture. The implication being that like the Old Testament scripture, the New Testament writings, they are inspired by God. And they are the very words of God himself. And so Jesus believed in the inspiration of Scripture. And then Jesus spoke with the very authority of Scripture. And then Jesus sanctioned the apostles to write authoritative Scripture through the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is not our words about God. It is God's Word to us. How are you doing? You hanging in there? (laughs) What we've been talking about here is the doctrine of inspiration. And there's a term that was coined to actually summarize uh, all of this. It's called verbal, plenary, confluent inspiration. I know that's a mouthful. Hang in with me and we'll get to relevance in just a second. By verbal, what we mean is that the very words of the Bible, not just the concepts, but the very words of the Bible are inspired by God. Again, in Matthew 5.18, Jesus says, Not the least stroke of a pen, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T in Scripture will pass away. So we believe that God actually chose the actual words of the Bible, that every word is important and that every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Second, plenary means all, all of Scripture. There are not parts of the Bible that we don't believe. There are not parts of the Bible that we won't teach. Uh, We believe that all of Scripture is God-breathed, as Paul says. Maybe a historical example of someone who didn't believe this would be Thomas Jefferson, a U.S. president who was a deist, and he actually sat down with a copy of his Bible and got out scissors, and he cut out all the parts that he didn't believe were right. That's the opposite of plenary. Thirdly, confluent. Confluent means that Scripture is both a product of the human author 
and also a product of God, and yet it is all inspired by God. Now, this does not require us to take a dictation view of the Bible where uh, men became mere robots or puppets. God actually did not obliterate the personality of uh, the writer, as they wrote, we can see that both King David and the Apostle Paul, for example, uh, their own personalities and vocabulary and styles actually shine through in their writings. And yet, what we're saying is that God supernaturally and providentially uh, supervised their work to ensure that what each author wrote uh, were his very word. And so the Bible is in one sense both a human and a divine book. But this dual authorship of Scripture does not imply imperfection any more than the two natures of Christ imply that our Savior must have sinned. So verbal, plenary, confluent inspiration. It's a mouthful, but it's as simple as this. What Scripture says, God says. What Scripture says, God says. The inspiration of Scripture entails that the Bible is entirely true and trustworthy. It is historically accurate, and you can bank your life on it. Kevin DeYoung, in a a great little book called Taking God at His Word, he summarizes it like this. The Word of God is true. The good news of Jesus Christ has been recorded in the facts of history. There was a man born of a woman in Bethlehem. Thousands of people saw him and knew him. He did miracles witnessed by multitudes. He died, rose again, and appeared to more than 500 witnesses. Everyone knew the location of the tomb, and it was empty and open to examination. We do not follow myths. We are not interested in stories with a nice moral to them. These things in the gospel story happened. God predicted them. He fulfilled them. He inspired the written record of them. And therefore, we ought to believe them. In short, the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, that was a little heavy. Question, why does this matter? This is where it gets important. Why should you care or anyone care whether the Bible is uh, our speaking about God or God's speaking to us? Whether the Bible is our word about God or God's word word to us. Well, basically, it's it's very important because this means that if it's God's word, if God has revealed himself, then the creator has not left us in the dark, groping about, trying to figure out what is true about reality. We are not people in a a dark universe, uh, groping for what might be true, groping for what God might be like, trying to figure out what this life is all about. No, God is actually revealed himself to us. He has shown us who he is and who we are and how he's designed the universe. And then he's actually called us to himself and shown us how we might find life through his son, Jesus. So why does this matter? I'm going to finish with three points from Colin Smith, who's a pastor from Chicago. He says there's three things that are lost terribly lost if the Bible is not the inspired, authoritative word of God. First, if God has not spoken, his promises are replaced by our mere wishes. He says, think about some of the great promises of Scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13.5. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Acts 16.31 My God will supply every need of yours according to his glorious riches. Philippians 4.19 Who said these things? If these words came from the mouth of God, if, if God said them, then they are indeed the word of God to us. They are promises on which we can depend. You can take them to the bank You can build your life on them. But if these are human words about God, then they're not promises on which we can depend, but merely wishes arising from the heart of Paul or from Isaiah. 
that may or may not be true at all. And so if you believe that the Bible is our word about God rather than God's word to us, you undermine the foundation of hope that we have and you replace God's promises to us with merely our wishes about God. Second, Smith says, if God has not spoken, then his truth is replaced by our opinion. The Bible says that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. These words are repeated no less than seven times actually in the New Testament. Sorry, in the Old Testament. But Smith asks again, whose words are these? If God spoke these words to Moses and the prophets, then we can be sure that he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love. Because he's the one who said it. He's actually disclosed himself to us. But if these words are merely the thoughts of Moses or David or Nehemiah or Jonah, then we do not have truth that we can count on for our lives today. All we have is the opinion of some men that arose for some reason or another, some experience they might have had, and it may or may not be true or prove useful for us today. And so when the Word of God when, when the word of God to us is viewed as our word about God, not only do his promises become wishes, but his truth then gets replaced with opinion. And all of this undermines our knowledge of God. Lastly, Smith says, if God has not spoken, then his invitation is replaced by our seeking. The Bible is full of invitations. Isaiah 55.3 says, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul, uh, hear that your soul may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Or James four eight, God says, "Draw near to God." James says, "God, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you." Or Isaiah one eighteen, "Come, let us reason together," says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Again, who said these things? If God said them to and through Isaiah and the Apostle James, then you can be certain that God is actually reaching out to you in love. And this means that that we can have confidence when we come to him. It means that we can enjoy a true and authentic relationship with the God of the universe who is our creator, who has invited us to come to him. But if these words are simply a reflection of the thoughts of James and Isaiah, then they're only pointers to their particular journey. They tell us maybe what they have found or think they've found, but they offer us no assurance that we will find the same God or the same invitation. And so if the Bible is viewed as our words about God rather than God's word to us, you may have people reaching out and seeking after God and finding very, very little. Why? Because what is lost is God reaching out in love through his son, Jesus Christ. And what you have left is people searching and striving and seeking aimlessly to find out what is true. So do you see how much is is at stake here? Everything's at stake. The basis for faith, hope, and love all rest on God having spoken giving us his promises, telling us who he is, and inviting us into a relationship with him through his son. And when I think about all of this, it makes me step back and breathe a deep sigh of relief that, thank God, the Bible is his inspired, authoritative word to us that we can know who he is and who we are, that we can come to him and freely receive salvation through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. All right, finally, how should we respond then to all of this? How do we respond to God's inspired and authoritative word? Well, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ 
dwell in you richly. The word of Christ here is synonymous with the word of God. And so let the word of God dwell in you richly. What does this mean? Well, it means let the word of God be the honored guest in your life. Don't just have a a, a passing brush with the word of God. Let the word live in you and abide in you. Now, if you're not a Christian, what does this look like? Well, I would encourage you, if you're not a Christian, simply pick up a Bible. Uh, Someone will be happy to give you one if you can find a Christian. They're at every major bookstore. Pick up a Bible and read. I'd encourage you to start with the Gospel of John and read about Jesus' life and his claims to be the Savior of the world. Now, if you are a Christian, what this means is I'd encourage you to let there be plenty of the Word of God in your life. Uh, Give the word an honored and prominent place in your life. Now, how can you do this? Well, number one, make the best use of Sundays. Uh, When we gather as the church, even when we gather online, we gather around the word of God. And so prioritize, even in this uh, online time, prioritize gathering with a church around the word to hear it sung, to hear it prayed, and to hear it preached. Number two, you can join a life group with other Christians and then make sure that your group uh, centers the group around the word of God. And then number three, establish a pattern of daily Bible reading and meditation. You can uh, join our church's Bible reading plan. You can download the YouVersion Bible app and pick a Bible reading Uh, plan from there. You could simply choose one book of the Bible and read it every day for a month until it begins to dwell in you. Or you could very simply just read one psalm a day, whether uh, it's first thing in the morning or before you go to bed. But what we want to do is we want to get the Bible into, uh, we want to get into the Bible until the Bible gets into us. There's no other book (laughs) like the Christian Bible. Divinely inspired, infallible, authoritative. You and I have in our Bibles the very word of the creator and redeemer of the universe. Now, William Tyndale is a name you may recognize. Uh, He is the first person to translate the New Testament into English. He did that in 1526. And he did it because he believed that the Bible was the Word of God, that it was the divinely inspired, infallible Word of God that the people needed in their own language that they might find life through Jesus Christ. And Tyndale paid for this with his life. He was strangled and then burned at the stake at age 42. So let's not play around with these precious words that God has given us. These are the words of God. Christ died to confirm them and to make it possible for sinners like you and me to understand them and to embrace them and to have life in his name. And thousands of others like Tyndall have died to preserve them so that we might have them with us today. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have spoken clearly through your word, that you have revealed yourself to us, that you sent Jesus to die on a cross to uh, spend his life teaching us who you are and revealing to us who you are, and that he then sent the Holy Spirit to inspire the apostles to then record these things down so that we might know who you are, and have a relationship with you. Father, we thank you that the only reason we know you is because of your grace, your gracious revelation of yourself to us. God, I pray that you would uh, help us to believe the right things about your word, to have the right feelings and affections for your word, and then to obey your word and to respond to it in the appropriate way. That we might find life through you and that you might be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you all for joining us today. I pray that God has touched your heart through the message, through our singing, through the prayer time. And uh, if you can, join us to today, uh, Sunday at 11.30 at the church building. There will be protocols to follow with signing in, uh, bringing your own mask, having a, bring your lunch and uh, a beverage to drink. Uh, we miss seeing you all. So if you can come, great. If not, remember, we will not be having it on Father's Day here at the church, but we will come back the following week on the 28th. God bless you, and uh, may you go in His Spirit this week. <laughs>